to thank you for the privilege, the honor uh, that is ours to be your sons and daughters. And tonight, as we talk about this very difficult and important subject of suffering, and uh, specifically as we look at the issue of, of why do children suffer, why does anyone suffer, um, may your spirit be with us, and, and may you give me wisdom and the ability to communicate um, the biblical answer in a compelling way. Uh, Father, we don't have every answer to every question that we could possibly ask. We know that. Um, but we are persuaded that we know the general direction and trajectory of the right answers. And so as we open Scripture now and as we seek to continue to understand uh, this great truth that you are love, um, may we understand that you are love even in the midst of, of suffering. Uh, be with us now as we open our Bibles, and as we open our minds to you, in Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, what we want to do is sort of begin by just reminding ourselves of our basic premise. And uh, our premise is, and is going to continue to be, as we build on the table of truth, uh, that God is love. And uh, this is exactly John's point in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He says, He that does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Let me just sort of give you a paraphrase of that. He's essentially saying that if you're not a loving person, if, if love is not the supreme value around which you orient your life, he says you couldn't possibly know what God is about because God is that thing, right? God is that very thing. And we've already made the important distinction that he is not merely loving, which would be an adjective describing a behavior or a characteristic of God. That would be a rather modest claim. I am loving at times. You are loving at times. And so if John had merely said, God is loving, well, that would have been fine. And that would have been, frankly, very easy. But John goes a step beyond, in fact, several steps beyond. When he gives us a grammatical and theological equivalence, he says not merely that God is loving in his characteristics or in his personality, but God is love in his essential nature. And here, this idea that God is love is our cornerstone. It's, it's the platform from which we are building. And if you're paying attention, there are other things. I don't have other water bottles, so you just have to have them imaginary in your mind. But there are other things that are beginning to make their way onto the table. For example, in our last presentation, creation. The whole idea of God creating and, and creating something that's good makes its way onto the table. And as we sort of hold up the truth that God is love and the truth of, of a God who has created, we see that there's fundamental compatibility, and not just compatibility, but there's complementarity there. That, that stands to reason. In fact, I'll say something here that some of you, hopefully all of you will get, some of you will definitely get. If you don't get it, never mind, but just see if you can, if you can appreciate the force of this statement. Creation did not make God loving. God's love made creation. Do you hear the difference? It's not as though God was ambivalent or neutral, and then he said, well, I'll just make something, and then he made something, and then suddenly think, oh, I think I, I think I could love that. And then God's love grew out of his having created. No, 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 no. Scripture teaches that God's, God's creation grew out of his love, not that his love grew out, oh, hey, there, here's something to love. I might as well love it. Oh, no. God loved, and therefore he created, and this is exactly how Scripture opens. We've said before that Scripture opens with the arresting line, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But there is a, a phrase that comes up over and over again here in Genesis chapter 1, and the phrase is, and it was good. Let's just spend a moment sort of reflecting on that phrase. I'll read verse 2 here. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Then God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Now, that phrase is going to occur over and over again in, in the Genesis 1 account. Let's jump down to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the water he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Good. Verse 18, uh, 17 and 18. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Verse 21. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was 
Good. We're seeing a recurrent theme here. We've got two more. Verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was... Now, in Genesis chapter 1, as this series of good, 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 good comes to its climax, verse 31 actually takes it a step further. When God saw everything that he had made, the whole of composite creation, it says, indeed it was what? Very good. So that's how scripture opens. Genesis chapters 1 and 2 open with God as a creator, and, and frankly, that's what love does. Love creates. My wife and I were married April 4th, 1999. We spent two and a half years together as, as just married but without children. And we decided, as couples often do, it's not always as well planned and organized as we'd like, but couples will say, hey, we, let's have children. Well, why pray tell? I mean, is it, is it simply, as we discussed in our last presentation, is it merely the propagation of our DNA? Is it simply the Darwinian impulse to have kids? No, and I don't even think it's just the sexual impulse to have kids because there's birth control. Why have children? Well, in, in no small degree, it's because you have a love with your spouse and you want to share that love with others. Hey, let's, let's have children so that we can share our love with them and they can reciprocate and share that love with us and we can be a family unit. And that's exactly what we, we see here in the opening chapters of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, God says, let us make man in our image. And we've mentioned that the thing that is most fully and 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 cons the thing that is most fully in the image of God is not the male gender or the female gender. It's the family. God, as a family, makes a family in His image, and I want you to appreciate the breadth and the depth of that. God, as a relational entity, He is relational in His essential nature. God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a divine family, a divine society, a divine relationship. No wonder then that life is so rapidly relational. It's so awesomely relational. We love to connect and to be connected with. And, and whether it's the family unit or our friends or whatever it is, Mark Zuckerberg has made his billions of dollars by creating something called Facebook. But Facebook didn't create the relational reality. What it did is it gave us a modern technological way to tap into a reality that was always there. People long and love to connect, to reach out, to, to be in, in connection. And that's, you are wired that way because God is that way. When God made mankind in His image as a relational being, in fact, it's beautiful. I, I wish I had time to develop the profundity of this relationality of Adam and Eve. But one of the things that's really awesome there is that God purposefully brings the animals before Adam in twos. Two, 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 two. So that Adam can begin to feel a longing that he might have not otherwise come to realize with that same m amount of force. But he begins to look around and he sees the giraffe and he's like, yeah, they're nice, but uh, I'm not feeling that. And he sees the hippopotamus and he's like, nah, a little round for me. He's like, oh, where, where's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? And, and then God is trying to create a void within Adam so that when Adam sees that is what I've been waiting for, right? When he sees that, there's a connection. There's a connectivity there. And God says, the first thing he says to the both of them is be fruitful and multiply. In other words... God builds Adam and Eve as a relational reality, and then he tells others, he, or tells them to, to make others, to make still others, to make still others. Now, this basic picture that reality is at its most fundamental level relational is a beautiful picture. In fact, a, a well-known evangelical theologian, a man by the name of Millard Erickson, he said a very interesting thing. He said, if reality is fundamentally physical, that is matter and energy, no God, atheism, if reality is fundamentally physical, the most powerful constituting force, that is the force that holds things together, he says, would be electromagnetism. It's the, it's the main force that keeps the atoms together and keeps the molecules together, electromagnetism. He says, but if reality is fundamentally social, then the most powerful constituting force would be that which binds persons together, namely love. These are the two different palettes that we're talking about. If reality is just matter and, and energy in motion, then the picture that emerges is a bleak and black picture, right? It's just electromagnetism and, and neurochemistry and, you know, purposelessness on the dunghill as we've talked about. But, but if God is love and is in his fundamental nature, if that is the truth about the universe, 
Well, then all of these beautiful vistas and panoramas begin to open up in which we are so relationally wired ourselves because God made us that way. And when Scripture opens up, it opens up with this beautiful picture, not only of horizontal relational integrity, Adam to Eve and, and eventually to their children that will yet to come, but this vertical relationality where, where, where God is in a relationship with them and they with God. It's this beautiful familial picture. In fact, just one quick little word on that. God as a family, the family of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, made another family in His image, but then they all are now, and this is a really cool concept, the family of God. All of it, the human family and the divine family and even the angelic family are all the family of God, but that family was broken, and we're going to talk about that right now. Our starting point here, and, and Scripture's starting point, is a fundamental truth about the nature of reality and the nature of God, and that is that God is love. Now, there are a great many people who would love to believe that, who really want to believe that, but they have a, uh, a problem, they have a difficulty with believing that because they just see so much pain, they see so much suffering, they see so much hurt in the world that they just think there couldn't possibly be a good God at the head of all this. And so they say, either God is unworthy of my worship and adoration, it must be that kind of a God who actually takes pleasure in suffering, or perhaps even more likely, there is no God. And people are driven from God by the existence and the ubiquity of suffering. Charles Darwin was one of those people. As we've already mentioned, he was studying for uh, the ministry at Cambridge University, but when he left at the age of 22 to go sailing on his naturalist uh, voyage as an amateur naturalist on the HMS Beagle, he began to see the ubiquity of suffering, uh, and, and he wanted an explanation for it. In other words, his theory did not start primarily as a scientific theory, but as a religious explanation, and I want you to appreciate that. By the way, this is well documented. Darwin's theory, I want to say it again, did not begin primarily as a biological theory. It began as a religious explanation for the existence of suffering. That's part of what we're going to talk about here. This is um, uh, Darwin here, writing actually in, I think, Origin of Species. That there is much suffering in the world no one disputes. Some have attempted to explain it in reference to human beings, imagining that it serves their moral improvement. But the number of people in the world is nothing compared with the numbers of other sentient beings, and these often suffer greatly without any moral improvement. A being so powerful and as full of knowledge as a god who could create the universe is to our finite minds omnipotent and omniscient. And we've spent time talking about those two words. It revolts our understanding to suppose that his benevolence or his goodness is not unbounded. For what advantage can there be in the sufferings of millions of lower animals throughout almost endless time? This very old argument from the existence of, what's that word? Suffering against the existence of God, listen to this now, seems to me a strong one. And the abundant presence of suffering agrees well with the view that all organic beings have been developed through variation and natural selection. I want you to appreciate what he's saying here. First of all, it's a reasonably good point. He's got a great observation, but a bad solution. Right? His observation is the observation that every single person in this room has made, and that is that the world is often a broken and terrible and pain-filled place. Yes or no? Right? You just turn on the news, and it's just like bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. Right? The world is a terrible, hurt, uh, hurting and pain-filled place. Now, that, you might be saying, well, how does, that, how does that square with the picture that we've been painting? Well, I'm going to show you that rather than seeing... God is love and the existence of suffering as fundamentally incompatible. We're going to discover tonight they are perfectly compatible. And uh, even though it pains the heart of God more than it pains any of our hearts, by the way, suffering is the necessary consequence of God allowing people to make their own decisions. And we're going to discover that. Um, now, sort of with that kind of in mind, let's continue to sort of develop our case here. First of all, one of the things that I love about Scripture, and I've already mentioned Romans chapter 8 last night in our presentation, or yesterday, in Romans chapter 8, we, we went to one of my favorite verses. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And we talked about that, the significance that God reveals Himself to us internally and intuitively. We know that He is there. But also in that very same chapter, which is my favorite chapter in my favorite book, Romans, um, chapter 8 here is a very interesting thing. Paul is writing about the condition of the earth, the condition of the world, and I want you to notice what he says. He says, the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. The creation itself, the earth. For we know that the whole creation, what is that word? 
groans. And it sounds just exactly like you said it. Groans, groans, right? It's onomatopoeic, isn't it? Um, the whole creation groans and, what's that word? Suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. I love this fact, and don't miss it. It's a significant one. The Bible does not ask us to put our brains on the shelf and to deny the reality of suffering. Did you get that? The Bible doesn't ask us to do that. The Bible not only does not ask us to deny the reality of suffering, it affirms that the world is a pain-filled, suffering place. Paul goes so far as to say that the creation itself groans awaiting, and he goes on to say in the next verse, awaiting its redemption. Okay? So it, it, it kind of reminds me of the fact that there are other faith systems we talked about uh, the three sort of versions. You have the, the idea that there is no God, atheism. You have the idea that God and the universe are one, monism, and then the idea of theism, where God is transcendent to the world. Here's an interesting point. In this view here, just very briefly, monism, which is um, the major proponents of monism would be Hinduism and Buddhism, but there are others. It's a very interesting picture that emerges of human suffering. Human suffering becomes actually illusory, an illusion. Um, as we mentioned in that sort of system, we spent a little bit of time on it. All things are, are fundamentally illusory if they communicate a distinction between this and that, right? And uh, I read a little poem several years ago, and I don't know why. It just stuck with me. I didn't make any effort to remember it, but it just stuck with me, and it went like this. A certain faith healer from Deal asserted that pain is not real. Then please tell me why, came the patient's reply. When I sit on a pin and I puncture my skin, do I hate what I fancy I feel? You get it? He's basically saying, if pain isn't real, then how come when I sat on that pin, woo, that hurt, right? That didn't feel like an illusion. That felt like that hurt, right? What I love is that Scripture does not ask us to take our brains out and stick them on a shelf and say, no, there's really no suffering in the world. I had a friend that was of another particular religious persuasion that will go unnamed right now when I was going to high school. And her particular religious persuasion was one in which they denied the existence of sickness and of suffering and they sort of expected you to just... They said, it's only there because you think it's there. Just, just Im imagine that it's not there and it will go away. But it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way when a little girl is kidnapped from her front yard and taken away and abused and raped and, and dumped in a, in, a, in, a, in a dumpster that you can't just imagine that away. You can't pretend like that didn't happen and then suddenly it didn't happen. No, we live in a pain-filled world, right? We live in a world where people kill other people because of the color of their skin or the height or the shape of their noses or a hundred other things. We can't just pretend that that's not there and suddenly the world becomes a happy-go-lucky place. No, suffering is real. And Darwin took a look at suffering in the biological world, not just at the human level, but at the, at the animal, at the, uh, the, the whole um, uh, uh, biological kingdom. And we, we do the same thing. And there are a great many people who look at suffering and particularly the suffering of children. And they say, how could there be a God? How could there be a God? How could that possibly be the case? I want you to know that Scripture affirms that basic feeling. Scripture gives you total permission to, to feel the pain, the groanings of a suffering world. Are you with me on that? Here's another one. This is from Revelation chapter 21. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor what? Pain. You could easily insert the word what? Suffering. There will be no more suffering, for the former things have passed away. In other words, in, in a promising a world in which there is no tears, is no pain, is no suffering, it's a tacit admission that this world is filled with it. Yeah? So I love that fact, and don't miss this subtle but significant point that Scripture does not ask us to deny the reality and the ubiquity of suffering in the world. No, 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 no. No, in fact, Jesus on one occasion, somebody came to him and, and uh, basically was, was asking him about this. I think it's in Luke chapter 13. It's a very interesting story. And uh, Jesus says, don't you know the story about the... You've heard that the, tire, the uh, Tower of Siloam fell on those people and killed them? Right? He said, I tell you that the lesson, your takeaway lesson from that, he says, is that you should repent. Change your ways or you will perish like they perished. It, it, I, I, I've always wrestled with that pastor of, passage of Scripture. Let me just quickly check and make sure it is Luke 13, just so I can be sure that I'm telling you the... the and if it's not Luke 13, I don't know what it is, so I'm just kind of checking to see if I got it right. Um, yeah, it's Luke 13. I've always sort of wrestled with that because Jesus here, and he doesn't do it nonchalantly. I sense that there is real pain and real concern in the way that he said it. But 
but he just talks about a tower falling on people and killing them as if that's just part of the way that this world works. Right? Jesus didn't have the idea that God would at every possible moment, whoa, 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 stop that car, and, and whoa, there's somebody that's about ready to drown. No, Jesus talks about this tower falling on people and killing them as that's the way this world works. It's broken. Well, that raises the question, why? And why would God let it be that way? Why would God allow the world to be like that? People have assumed, as Darwin did, that there is a fundamental incompatibility with the existence of suffering and pain and hurt and even death and God's goodness. What we're going to try and show tonight is that there's not an incompatibility at all, but there's actually a beautiful compatibility. And what Scripture is saying is there is suffering for a time but it will go away. In fact, if you even go back to the earlier passage that we quoted already, Romans 8, he calls it the suffering and pains of childbirth. Now let the significance of that analogy sink in. Right? When a woman is in labor pains, when she's having her, her increasing contractions, right? Um, that's a pain-filled, scary experience, right? I mean, it can be a very pain-filled and scary experience. But, but Paul's use, by the way, Jesus uses the same analogy repeatedly. Paul and Jesus' use of childbirth is a fascinating one because think about it. It's, it's pain and it's contractions and it's frequency and it's intensity that results in new life. In other words, the, the point of the analogy is that childbirth is directional, it's intentional, and it ends in good news. Do you follow that? It's a beautiful analogy here. So both Paul and John here in Revelation are saying, yes, this world is filled with pain. Yes, this world is filled with hurt. Yes, yes, yes. The Bible does not ask us to put our brains on a shelf and say, oh, no, the world is absolutely great in every uh, particular. No. Scripture is saying, yeah, it is that way. But it won't always be that way. Which raises the question, well, why then is it that way? We began this by saying that in the beginning God created and it was good, 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 it was good. And there are certainly elements of the world today that are good, but it's not all good. And I want to know why. Why is that? Let's continue to develop this. John Milton wrote what many consider to be the classic of the English language, and that's Paradise Lost. Very interesting story how he wrote the book. He was blind by the time he wrote the book, and he dictated it to his daughters. He had the whole thing in his mind. He couldn't write. He just said it, and they wrote it down. They wrote it down. It was all in his mind. And it's a monumentally, epically long poem. And in the introduction to the book, Milton basically says that the reason he wrote the book was to, quote, justify the ways of God to men. In other words, try to explain the existence of evil. Try to explain the existence of pain and of death and of suffering. To, to, the, by the way, the technical term for this, it's called a theodicy. A theodicy, and, and, and the word theodicy comes from two words, theos, which is God, and dike, which is justice. Theodicy is to try and explain the goodness of God, the justice of God, in the face of ubiquitous evil and suffering, right? How do we say that God is good, that God is love, and yet affirm and, and, and be able to affirm the reality of suffering in the world? And, and Milton said, that's why I wrote my poem, Paradise Lost to justify the ways of God to men. Now, Cornelius Hunter in his book, Darwin's God, made an awesome observation about both Milton and Darwin. And uh, this might go slightly over the heads of some of us, but I just want to say it anyway. Both Milton and Darwin viewed God as primarily deterministic, as a God who made decisions, okay, and that, and that, and that's going to happen, and that's going to happen, and that's going to happen, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that's what I want. The primary, the primary over here where we're beginning with our basic building block that God is love, both Milton and Darwin, fascinatingly, would have begun with a very different building block. Complementary, but different, and I think it's the wrong building block, and that is God is sovereign. God is powerful. God is in control. Right? And when you begin with your fundamental truth about God is that God is powerful, God is sovereign, and God is in control. By the way, are all of those things true? Yeah, but those are primarily statements about God's, about, about God's nature. That tells us a lot about what he is, but who is he? What kind of a being is he? Now watch, watch the point that Cornelius Hunter makes here about Darwin and Milton, who both had this deterministic view of God, that God decides you'll be saved, you'll be lost, you'll be in, you'll be out, this tower will fall on these people, this tower won't fall on these people. You know, we have a God who's like a puppet master, who's like micro-engineering what's going to happen in the world. Scripture doesn't paint this picture at all, and we're going to unpack that. 
He says both men were dealing with the problem of evil. Milton with moral evil and Darwin with natural evil. And both found solutions. Now watch this. This is key for our whole presentation. We're asking the question, why do children suffer? Both Darwin and Milton, and by the way, you could say millions of Christians today, find the solution. How? In distancing God from evil. Distancing God from pain. Distancing God from suffering. Most important, the two held similar conceptions of God, similar pictures or ideas of God, and that's the deterministic God we've talked about. What exactly did Darwin expect God's creation to look like? We may never know. But for our purposes, the point is that Darwin was significantly motivated by non-scientific premises. He had a specific notion of God in view, and as it had for Milton, that view defined the framework of his thinking. Oh, I wish I had time to develop this. What he's basically saying is, whatever you start with, your basic picture of God, if you start with this, everything flows out from this. The way you see the world, the way you see relationships, the way you see suffering, the way you see... It all flows out from your basic picture of who God is. Right? And, and both Milton and Darwin, to, to greater or lesser degrees and to significant degrees, began, I'm, I'm maintaining, from the wrong starting point. Right? And the starting point, what is our starting point? What is it? That God is love. Continuing on here. Uh, Though biology was young and little was known about how organisms actually worked, Darwin believed that he had sufficient evidence to show that God would not have created this world. Darwin's theory of evolution was very much a solution to the problem of natural evil. It was a theodicy. Now, this is interesting. Darwin, from a biological standpoint, is writing a theodicy. He's trying to say that God's ways cannot be justified to men. And Milton's writing a poem from a theological and literary perspective, and he's trying to do the same thing. And Cornelius Hunter's point here is an awesome one. And he said both of them, their solution was essentially by distancing God from suffering and from evil and from pain. D Darwin eventually distanced God so far from it that he said there is no God. He just kicked him out of the universe. Doosh, we don't need a God anymore. What's he, what was he doing here all along? What I want to show you tonight is that the solution is actually at the opposite end of that pole. The solution, the, the, the answer to the question of suffering, and, and I'll just give you the punchline here so that we can develop it. The answer to the problem of suffering and the, and, the, and the solution, well, I don't have every answer, but I know where the answer is headed, is this. Scripture paints a picture of a God who suffers with his creation. The solution does not come in distancing him from evil, distancing him from pain, and distancing him from suffering. The opposite picture is painted. The picture that emerges in Scripture is of a God who draws near to his creation, draws near to it in its brokenness, in its pain. And this is where it gets amazing. This is where the biblical story is just over the top. It's frankly amazing. He draws so near to its brokenness, to its pain, to its suffering. He draws so close and so near to it that he even draws near to to its greatest problem, death. That's the picture. Not of a God who's ambivalent and, and disinterested and, and uh, hardly aware that there are suffering children and, and wars and, and, and diseases and, and rape and genocide. Oh, he's just sort of can hardly be bothered in some sort of deistic sense. Oh, no. The picture of Scripture is of a God who comes near to suffering. It's as if. And this gets back to the thing I was saying about Luke 13. Jesus treats the tower falling on the people like, yeah, those things happen. But God's solution is not to stop it at every possible, to plug every hole in the dam, because as we're going to see, that's impossible to do. If God is really going to honor our free choice, you can't plug it all up and just not let us have the consequences of our own decisions. But what God does do, and this is so beautiful, I just am overcome with emotion almost, that, that God draws near to us in the suffering. The consequences that we have created, that we have reaped, the things that we have done. Where God, God is not responsible. He, he doesn't have, but he draws near to us. And this is an amazing quotation that's really hard to read, but I want to read it for you anyway. It's from Fyodor Dostoevsky, and he puts these words in the mouth of one of the uh, major characters in the book, The Brothers Karamazov. This is Ivan Karamazov. And he's railing against God and, and just feel the pathos of his rage. He says, I want to see with my own eyes the hind lie down with the lion and the victim rise up and embrace his murderer. I want to be there when everyone suddenly understands what it has all been for. But then there are the children. And what am I to do about them? That's a question I can't answer. For the hundredth time I repeat, there are, 
numbers of questions, but I've only taken the children because in their case what I mean is so unanswerably clear. Listen, if all must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony, what have the children to do with it? Tell me, please. What good can hell do since those children have already suffered? And if the sufferings of the children go to swell the sum of sufferings which was necessary to pay for the truth, look at what he says, then I protest the truth is not worth the price. Do you feel the, pain, do you feel the pathos of that, the pain of that? At some, level, as, as some, at some level, as somebody who believes the Bible and who affirms the Bible, I have to be able to give an answer to that question. And I'm afraid of that question. But, but here's the point. I don't have all of the data. And here it is. And A plus B equals C. And you carry this, carry the two. You multiply that by three. Two, and here's your answer. No. The answer is not in data. It's not in a theological or a philosophical explanation. The answer to the question lies in the fact that God is not aloof and distant and separate from our sufferings, but that God, as, as it was said of Jesus, you will call his name Emmanuel. God with us, that he is with us in our suffering. And as we develop this picture, we're going to see that his suffering actually transcends any suffering that a human being could feel. Well, it's at this point that somebody might raise the very legitimate question, well, why suffering at all? And the short answer, according to Scripture, is a very interesting one, and it is that there was an angelic rebellion against God's government of goodness and love. Now, I know that's a tough pill for irreligious people to swallow, and I recognize that. But I want you to think it through because I think it is the best explanation available. I really do. Um, there is every reason to believe that there is a devil, um, in my opinion. Uh, we talk about actual evil and actual um, uh, immoral acts as if there's something tangible, there's something significant there. Well, it stands to reason that if there is actual immorality and actual sin or rebellion or transgression, there had to have been a first being to have ever done that. There had to have been some being that decided for the first time, if this, obviously no one denies that it's in existence today, uh, except for that religious group that we talked about earlier, some of those religious groups, there had to have been some figure, and this is exactly what Scripture says. Scripture says, yes, evil and pain and suffering are directly traceable to the free decision that one of God's own creatures made, and this is amazing. C.S. Lewis calls this the greatest miracle, that the Creator would make a creation that was capable of resisting him. I'm just going to let that settle in. <sighs> that the creator, who is omnipotent, who is omniscient, who is omnipresent, the whole idea, this gets back to the aesthetics of the Christian story, just the idea that the creator would make a creation and then invest it with real will, with real intelligence, with real reasoning, and with real volition, so that if it chose to, it was under no obligation to, and it was certainly encouraged not to, but if he or she or it chose to, it could resist the Creator. The idea that the Creator can be resisted by his own handiwork is the greatest of divine miracles. I want to say that again. The idea that the, cre the creator can be resisted by his own creation is the greatest of divine miracles. Because without it, you don't exist. You are merely a puppet or a marionette that does what God tells you to do. But what if God made you you and gave you a choice, a real choice? A choice that was so significant and so pregnant with potential that, that you could actually resist the very one that had given you the choice itself. And scripture says things like this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The great dragon was thrown down. The Bible calls him a dragon. That ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Here the Bible fingers this angelic power. It calls him the devil and Satan or Satan. The, the Greek word here is a transliteration of the Hebrew word satan, which means the accuser, the one who, who opposes, who stands against. It's not really a proper name like David or Mark or, or Randy, but we've turned it into a proper name, the satan, the one who opposes not only us, but, but in his primordial and original rebellion, the one who opted to use his free will, his choice, that giftedness that God had given him to oppose the very God that had given it. Jesus says it like this, and this is one of the most amazing statements in all the New Testament. Jesus was speaking to the religious leaders of his day who were blinded to his messianic identity. He said, you are of your father the devil. 
Your will is to do his desires. Remember, that's the idea that I told you was on the shelf from the last presentation. Desire, it's all about what I want. My desires. The Bible calls this lust, by the way. Lust doesn't necessarily mean sexual uh, attraction. It just means any strong desire. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's just about me and mine and more. And, and I want that girl and I want that food and I want that car and I want that money. And I want, that's lust. Certainly it can have a sexual connotation, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be that. It could just be this whole desire. If you've ever seen a modern rap video, about 90% of rap videos, you are seeing this, this epitomized. Yo, it's me and it's my car and I got money and it's me. I'm not saying all rappers are that way. But, but the, what I, when I first came into the Christian church, some of my friends were into this, this like gangster rap stuff. And it was just like a joke. It was like, who could have the bigger ego? Like, like you're, you're just a... I, anyway, I don't even want to get into that. It's just astonishing that it's like, really? 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 That's it. That's the sum total of life. You can't, look at all these gold chains around my neck. <laughs> you can only drive one car at a time. I mean, really? That's the, that's the thing? Right? But look at what Jesus says here. Your will is to do his desires... He was a murderer from the beginning. Now, that is such a strange thing to say because in the initial rebellion, he committed no murder. Now, hold on to this thought. In the initial rebellion, according to Scripture, he simply began to raise questions and in, insinuations about the government of God, of God, about the character of God. He never murdered somebody at the beginning, but Jesus said he was a murderer at the beginning. How so? And here's the point. Don't miss this. Because sin is murderous in its intent. Don't miss that. Sin does not have to be murder to be murderous in its intent. Because murder fundamentally is, I so want this, whatever it is, fill in the blank. I will kill you to get it. I will take another person's life away from him to get because it's about me. And Jesus said, you don't have to be a murderer in order to be a murderer. He said, you can just be angry with your brother to such a degree that you literally are murdering him in your heart. So it's very interesting. Jesus here says that, that this, rebe this rebel, this Satan, was a murderer from the beginning, but he didn't commit a murder in the beginning. Well, how was he a murderer? Because me and mine and more and want and lust and desire and selfishness is murderous by nature. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to be the big dog. I'm going to be the big banana. And if you don't get on my program, I'll just whack you. Do, do you feel that? What a fascinating thing to say. He was a murderer from the beginning. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so the picture that's emerging here, and if time allowed, we could spend literally... The next 10 hours, in fact, I've written a whole book on this, a whole book called God in Pain, in which I, I devote a significant part of that, about half of that, or maybe a third, to the satanic rebellion against the government of God. And I'm not here to, to develop all of the passages, Job chapter 1, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Revelation 12, but simply to point out that in, in principle, what the rebellion is saying is, it's about me. It's mine, right? And Jesus says, that's murderous. You take that to its logical conclusion, right? And it's going to end up at a place that looks just like Golgotha. It looks like Calvary, right? Where the devil is finally pounding that old Jesus to a cross. If you would have asked Satan early on in his rebellion, what do you want to do? Kill God? He would have said, no, I don't want to kill God. I just want to do things slightly my own way. I just want to do things a little different. See, but God with his foresight, God with his omniscience could look and see that that path that he was on went around the mountain, around that mountain, through that valley, over that hill, up that ridge, down that coastline, and it ended here at the crucifixion of Jesus. He said, I'll tell you where this is going to go. You're going to turn into a murderer. You're going to kill. You're going to take life that does not rightfully belong to you. No, I would never do. You will. And that's exactly where sin ends up. Sin ends up as, I'm the king, I'm the boss, I'm the one. And I want to remind you again, Jesus, never, Jesus didn't say, you have to be a murderer to be a murderer. He said, no, 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 no. You can murder in your attitude towards someone, right? You can murder in, in your anger at someone. You can murder in your gossip. By the way, we call that character assassination. 
because ultimately it's about me. You know, I'm going to be up here and you get down there. You get down those stairs. You get down there. Right? We can do it. We don't have to, you don't have to shoot the gun or lift the knife in order to kill somebody. We together, everyone, so far? Okay, good. First John chapter 3, verse 8, the devil sinned from the beginning. He rebelled against the government of God, the government of goodness, the government of love. Well, why did Jesus come? The Son of God appeared for this purpose. What purpose? That he might destroy the works of the devil. He came to set the world right. And here's the most amazing thing. Even though he was omnipotent, even though he was powerful, even though he could have destroyed Satan as easily as a child just casts a pebble to the ground. I mean, just If it was a matter of strength, if it was a matter of power, if it was a matter of might or of puissance, this thing would be over in a moment. Thank you. For, no. God is not out to win a physical war, which is why it's fascinating all these like uh, superhero movies, you know, Iron Man and Spider-Man and Batman. They are all fundamentally broken, but they're actually tapping into a fundamental reality within the human psyche. We all sense that we need to be saved. Right? Why are these movies catching on so much? Because people have an almost schizophrenic, paranoid sense that we need a rescue. Right? But all that Hollywood can give us, all that the Batmans, the Iron Mans, the Spider Mans, and the Supermans of the world, all they can give us, watch this, this is important is a physical deliverance from a physical problem by physical violence. That's it. That's all that, that's all that they can offer. But, but if that's what it was about, according to Scripture, God is omnipotent. He could have come, flex his muscles, and the hosts of Satan are instantly gone. But God was not out to win a physical melee against physical foes with physical violence. He was out to win, watch this, he was out to win our affections. Not with the strength of his nature and power, but with the strength of his character. To woo his creation back to him. That's the point. Remember, the miracle is that God would create and fashion something that was capable of resisting him. He could have snapped his fingers and that thing would have been like, okay, you're out of here. Broken. No. No, he woos us back. He comes, he, he walks a mile in our moccasin, so to speak. He spends time with us. He, he experiences the pain and the hardship and the suffering and the vicissitudes of life. And he even goes so far as to experience death, and not any ordinary death, but an extraordinary death, a terrible death, a tragic and torturous death, to such a degree that when he dies that death, the last words on his lips are not, I'll get you! No, because he could have come down from the cross at that very moment and whacked everybody at good ones had he so desired. The last words, who is this God? Who is this guy? What's he all about? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he breathes his last. That's who God is? That's an awesome picture, beloved. That is so beautiful. That is so profound. If this is true, and I have every reason to believe it is, it's awesome. Can you say amen to that? Whoo, I tell you, I don't have an answer to every question, but I know who has the answers. I feel a little bit like Daniel going in before Nebuchadnezzar. Man, I don't know what the answer is, but I know the one who knows the answer. And I know Jesus is the answer. Now, here's a cool little thing I want you to think about. Four simple principles that actually help us to understand the fundamental compatibility between a world filled with suffering and a God who is love. And it goes like this. Love, by its very nature, requires freedom. Everybody understands this intuitively, and the more words that I say to try to explain it, the less clear it will become. You know what that means, right? If a man forces himself on a woman, he's like, you will be intimate with me, you will have sex with me, we don't say, oh, that is so romantic. That's so beautiful. No, we were, that, that's revolting to us. It's disgusting to us because forced intimacy, otherwise known as rape, is not a pretty thing, it's an ugly thing, Right? The sexual union and, and the romantic intimacy between a man and a woman are beautiful because it's voluntary. The moment it ceases to be voluntary, it becomes gross and ugly and criminal. Are you with me? So this basic idea that love requires freedom is just, it's so intuitive we get it. Right? April 4th, 1999, I married my wife. And it was a beautiful and lovely ceremony there at the Elms Haven Seventh-day Adventist Church in Deer Park, California. And part of what made it so beautiful is that there was no man standing with a gun saying, okay, what's up? Do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband to have and to hold? Like poking the gun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sweetie, we're going to have a great honeymoon. No. Obviously, if my wife is coerced or cajoled or otherwise forced into marriage with me, what is that? 
So love requires freedom. But watch what follows necessarily from that. Freedom, true freedom, involves risk. Notice I said true freedom. If it's just artificial freedom or contrived freedom, there's no real risk. Right? Like if, if, if I give my son the keys to his toy remote control car, okay, have the keys to the remote control car. What's the risk in that, right? That he runs over a rabbit? I mean, I mean, really, very little. But when my teenage boy, and he's on the verge of, teen, of teenage, he's just turned 12, so I'm like sweating it. I'm like, wow, I almost have a teenager. This is terrifying. One of these days, Landon and my, my son Landon and Jable are going to come and say, hey, Dad, can we borrow the keys? I'm like, to the car? <laughs> yeah, 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 can we borrow the keys to the car? We want to run down to Southern California for a skateboard contest. I don't know. Uh... Can I go? <laughs> He'd be like, no, Dad, we just want to, just us. Can we just borrow the keys? I'm like, oh, man, this is crazy. My kids want to borrow the keys to my car. How did I get so old? How did they get so old? Well, after I figured all that out, now I have to make a decision. Am I going to, that's a risk. Is it risky to hand your teenager the keys? Yeah, that's right. Because freedom involves risk. Right? Freedom involves risk. Love requires freedom, but freedom involves risk. But watch this. Risk entails responsibility. If I hand those keys to my son, I am now entrusting him. I'm what? Trusting him with what's called responsibility. And when I give him responsibility, I am saying, as you now have this new freedom, there are morally superior choices and morally inferior choices. And I'm trusting you to make the better of the choices that are presented to you. Do you feel that? But this is the coolest thing. When somebody is given real trust to make better moral decisions, it's only in that venue and in that environment which somebody can actually grow and become a moral person. Let me say it this way. If no one's ever given the opportunity to make a moral decision, how could they ever grow morally? And it is for these four reasons right here that God made the universe the way that he did. It's for these four reasons right here. They make such good sense and they're so profoundly and solidly biblical. This is why there's suffering in the world because God has honored our choices to create a world that is filled with suffering. Love requires freedom and a God who is love created in the beginning. It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. And of course it was good because God gave freedom. God loved and he, he really loved them and so he gave them freedom. But he knew that when he gave them freedom he was necessarily inviting risk potentially into the picture. Okay? It, in, it entails risk. It, it involves risk. But risk entails responsibility. Adam, now I'm expecting you to make the right decision. Here's option A. Here's option B. Option A is the morally superior choice. B is the inferior choice. I'm expecting you to make A. And if Adam makes the decision A, and then he repeatedly and consistently makes decision A, 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 he is growing and becoming a moral person, a virtuous person. And I tell my son this all the time. He'll ask questions like, Dad, how old do I have to be to fill in the blank, whatever it is? I say, your age has, is irrelevant almost. Yeah, but I, I don't care about your age. The question is not how old do you have to be, but how mature do you have to be? I, I said, I'll treat you like an 18-year-old right now if you show that you can consistently make the decisions that you would make as an 18-year-old. Do you feel that? By the way, that's how God treats us. God treats us and basically says, I, I, complete, I trust you to make good. And when, and when we make the right decision, the right decision, we're faced with the joy. Oh, what do I do? No, no, no. You make the right choice, the right choice. Your strength, your core muscles, as it were, actually become stronger. And an amazing trans, trans, uh, um, transformative thing begins to happen. It actually becomes possible for, for it to be the natural thing to make the decision that is consistent with God's will. Did you get that? It becomes natural to make the decision that's consistent with God's will. Now, according to Scripture, and I'm talking about a lot of different things here, this happens only by His Spirit. You can't just manufacture that. You can't just create that. But God gives you His Spirit, and you trust in Jesus. For when you do, whoop, whoop, fall and make a mistake, Jesus is there. A just man falls seven times and rises up again. Right? So when you fall and when you fail, Jesus is there because we do need a Savior. But then he invites us to go and sin no more, which is what he said to the woman in John chapter 8. He trusted her with her own freedom. What a renegade thing to do. He had no reason to trust her. She had a, a lifetime of habits and making bad choice, bad choice, bad choice, bad choice, bad choice. Jesus forgives. And then an act of what can only be described as prodigal forgiveness, he has the audacity to say, now go and sin no more. This is a beautiful picture, and I wish I had time to develop this. God puts faith in this woman. 
I hope you heard that. Because we always think, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The woman had faith in Jesus. Oh, no, 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 go read the story again. Go read many biblical stories again. And you'll find that, in fact, what God is often doing is he's putting faith in the people. And there's an amazing thing that happens in the human psyche when someone exercises faith in you. When someone says, you can do it. You're going to be okay. You're going to be... They, they've done study after study after study after study after study. And you've probably seen it in your own experience, either with someone telling you or you telling someone. When you really believe in someone and you tell them, hey, you're going to do this. You can succeed. I believe in you. I trust you. I have faith in you. People start to feel, man, I... Yeah, I, I, I can't. Are you with me? Yes or no? It's amazing. It's, it's funny. Like, I'm a runner, right? And so I, I love to run marathons and half marathons. And it's just crazy how the, how the human psyche works. I mean, you'll be running through the streets of whatever, Sacramento or, or you know, Medford, Oregon or wherever. I don't know these people. And I'm just like running. I'm at like mile 23, feeling like I'm going to die. My legs are going to fall off and I've got three miles to go. And people that I don't even know are standing on the side like, like hitting drums and like cheering and like holding out like water. Like, you're going to do it. You look great. You're going to be all right. I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, I don't know these people. I got like little five-year-olds like, high five. I'm like, I'm dying. And people are like, you look good. Keep going. Good job. And it's amazing what happens. Many people, and I want to say this, many people here in this room have had, have, didn't have a family situation and maybe you don't even have a friend situation where someone has really believed in you. Oh, it's one of the most beautiful and liberating things. And one of the great truths is that God believes in you. He trusts you. with. He says, hey, I, you've got a Savior, so when you fall, you make a mistake. Hey, we got that taken care of. We got a safety net. Now let's get up. Let's, let's do this right. Go and sin no more. It's awesome. God has built the universe with a moral fabric. With a what, everyone? Moral. moral fabric. By the way, that's how you're going to become a moral person. A good person, a godly person, a loving person. I'll say it this way. Over the course of your life, through your adolescent years, your teen years, and your, your early adulthood, and your midlife, and then later, you know what you're doing? You're making decisions. Life is filled with choices. But watch this. You make your choices, and over time, you know what happens? Your choices make you. Did you get that? You make your choices, and over time, your choices make you. By the way, this is, this is rock-bottom neuroscience right now. That's, just, that's the teaching of neurology. That's how the brain works. When you make a decision repeatedly, it becomes easy, even natural, to make that decision. We call them habits. The key is to form good habits. And the best way to form good habits is not in order to win the favor of God. I'll show God I'm serious. No, it's to trust in the goodness of God that even when you fail, he still loves you and he trusts you with your freedom. He gives you the opportunity. And when you have the sense that it's not just someone or anyone that believes in you, it's God that believes in you. Oh, I tell you, it's liberating. And Jesus said that. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Awesome. Okay, now here's the point I really want to get to in our last few minutes here. This is my last quotation. I'm skipping through a few things here, but that's all right. This is the point I want to get to right there. Boom. Look at these verses. Matthew 16, 21, Jesus must suffer many things. Matthew 17, 12, the Son of Man is to suffer. Luke 17, 24 and 25, the Son of Man must suffer. Luke 22, verse 15, I desire to eat with you before I suffer. Luke 24, 26, ought not the Christ to have suffered? Luke 24, 46, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. Acts 13, verse 18, the Christ would suffer. Acts 17, verse 3, the Christ had to suffer. Hebrews 2, verse 18, he himself suffered. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, Though he was a son, yet he suffered. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, Jesus suffered. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Christ suffered for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Christ suffered for sins. Beloved, the biblical picture is astonishing. It's that God had no responsibility for the initiation of evil or rebellion or suffering. None. He had, he had none. He, he didn't cause it. He didn't start it. We've already seen that when God created it, it was good. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. He had no responsibility. In fact, there's a parable that I just skipped over there in, Luke, in Matthew chapter 13 where Jesus pants, uh, plants this, this uh, field with wheat and all of a sudden the weeds spring up and the, the, owners of, uh, the, the helpers come to the owner of the, the field and they say, man, where'd all these weeds come from? Where'd the weeds come from? And Jesus' response is remarkable. In fact, it's a response we need to just cling to. He says, this is Matthew chapter 13, he says, an enemy has done this. Oh, I want you to feel the force of that. Jesus took no responsibility in the parable for the existence of the weeds. None. 
He said an enemy has done this. And that's exactly the picture in Scripture. We look at the world. We look at, we look at the suffering and the pain and all of that. And, and all of it is traceable in its origins. And by the way, I want to say a word here. It doesn't mean that every disease is caused by Satan or that every car accident is caused by Satan. Only that the initial rebellion was his. We, we are plenty capable of making really bad decisions without Satan's help. Yeah? And there are plenty evil people on the world right now who don't need Satan whispering in their ear to get them to do bad things. They're just making bad choices on their own. It's as if Satan pushed the, the, the snowball off the cliff and it, it went down. He was the first pusher, but we have walked in his footsteps. Right? Jesus had nothing to do with the origination of suffering or of pain or of rebellion or of evil. But what Scripture says is he draws near to us in it. He comes close to us. He draws near to us. He knows our moral failures and our moral fallings. He knows that, that we are victims sometimes of, of Satan's craftiness and deceit, such as was the case with Adam. And sometimes we just walk plain into it, let's be honest. Sometimes we make our own bad choices. And, and we don't need any coercing from any uh, you know, art, um, um, uh, arch enemy of God. We, just, we make our own choices. But, but what God does is he draws near to us in the suffering. That's, the, that's what scripture says. Jesus suffered. He suffered. He suffered. He suffered. He suffered. He suffered. And so whatever the answer is to the question of suffering children and suffering people and a suffering world and a suffering planet and a suffering ecology and a suffering family and a suffering nation, whatever the answer is, right? You can go the Darwinian way and say, well, that means there is no God. I cannot reconcile the ubiquity of suffering. Or you can say, wait a minute. What if the answer is God on a cross. Well, what's God doing on a cross? What's he doing there? I'll tell you what he's doing there. He's suffering. Why is he suffering? Well, according to Scripture, for our sins, for our rebellions, for our shortcomings. And do I have the answer to every single case and every single situation in which suffering occurs? I don't. But I know who does. And I know that no one endures suffering, no one endures pain, no one is enduring anything that God cannot relate and say, I, I know, I know, I know what, and I know, and I know, and I know, and I know, right? And at the end of the day, the human heart can endure a great deal of suffering, a great deal of pain, and a great deal of grief if we have a sense that someone is with us. It's when we're alone that we die. It's when we're alone that we perish. It's when we're alone that we can't endure. But if someone is with us and we look, there he is. Christ on the cross, God in human flesh, suffering with us and not just with us, alongside us and not just alongside us, for us. That's a God I can believe in. That's a God I can put my trust in. And that is a God that I can and trust the suffering children and others of this world to that kind of God.